Welcome back to another segment on GEMS Podcast. For those of you that are new to the ecosystem, I am the founder and host, Ms. Genesis Amaris Kemp. For those seasoned listeners, thank you so much for checking out another segment. With me today in the hot seat is a special guest by the name of Tissa Richards, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about who she is, and we're going to dive into this segment. So buck up your seatbelts and be ready for the ride. Tissa Richards has a mission to create a legion of leaders with an unshakable sense of self. She is a keynote speaker, leadership expert, and corporate facilitator who works with Fortune 1000 and hyperscale organizations, guiding them to create blueprints for individual and organizational success, develop high-performance cultures, and to diversify C-suites and corporate boardrooms. As a repeat software founder and CEO, Tissa sits at the intersection of entrepreneurship, fundraising, and executive leadership. She has raised millions of dollars for her companies, won awards for innovation and products, and holds multiple patents for complex cybersecurity software. She works closely with founders and business owners to create strategies for fearless, authentic, and reliable, resilient success. Her book, No Permission Needed, has recently hit number one new release on Amazon. And you can learn more by finding her on her website and all the things she does, which is tissarichards.com. But without further ado, let's bring on the woman behind it all, right? You want to hear from Tissa. Welcome, Tissa. Thank you so much. It's so great to be here and Happy New Year. It's uh, fun to be on the hot seat and start out the year right. Thank you so much for sharing and holding space and Happy New Year to you as well. And before we dive into the main part of the conversation, I want to jump into the connection segment, which is the part of the segment that allows the audience to get to know a little bit more about you personally and professionally. So there are two options to choose from. We could either do a rapid fire 10 question game, emphasis on rapid, or an icebreaker. What would you like? Oh my gosh. Uh, let's do let's do rapid fire 10 questions. Here we go, y'all. We're playing rapid fire with Tessa at Genesis. Do, 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 do. Question numero uno. What's one word to describe you? Uh, audacious. Question number two. When, when you think about leadership, what's one word that you have to see in a leader? Unshakable. Question number three, with being an author, hitting number one on Amazon, what was your first experience like when you saw that you hit number one? Very excited. Question four, if you could trade places with anyone for 20, 24 to 72 hours, would you trade places or remain yourself? I would stay myself. Question five, what is your drink of choice? Coffee, tea, or something else? Oh, tea or red wine. Depends on the time of day. Love it. <laughs> Question six. You just found out that you came across a windfall of money. It was inherited. You either won the lottery or et cetera. However, you must donate to three charities of your choice before the proceeds are released. What charities are you contributing to? Oh, my goodness. Um I really love the Animal Rescue Foundation in San Francisco. They're a no-kill shelter. Uh, I think something um, to an environmental cause, especially for sort of the mountains or kind of untouched, untouched nature. And I think something, um, something for women and founders. So starting companies. Love it. That also shows your servant leadership and your heart to give. Question seven. Keep me honest here. We're on seven, right? <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm focused on the answers. I think so. I think so. Question seven. What is your favorite color? Uh, Green. Oh, and your, wait, no, you have gray on. Yeah, but I do have my green scarf here in case I get cold. So yes, definitely green. I love it. Question eight. What is your happy place? My happy place is usually um, with my dog and a book or with just a small number of friends. Question nine, being an influential woman on the rise and being a CEO and maybe a male-dominated field, 
What's one advice you would give to these women bosses out here where they're not compromising who they are to appease the male dominated field? Always show up prepared and don't pretend to know something that you don't know. Love it. That's a good one, y'all. And question 10, it is our bonus question and here are the rules. If you choose to pass, our roles are reversed and you could ask me a question. If you choose to play, I ask one last question to wrap up rapid fire. So would you like to pass or play? Uh, I want to ask you a question. This is the most fun podcast I've ever been on. So I want to, I want, but I get to choose any question. Yes. No, let's keep that. Let, no, let's do it. You ask me because I was, I do, I'm not prepared. I didn't come prepared with questions. Oh gosh, you, you don't have a question? No, I, I no, I do have a question. Okay. What is the most unexpected answer one of your guests have, has ever given you? Ooh, okay. Now I gotta dial it back because we're now at episode 726. So it's a, it's a lot to think back on. I think one of the unexpected answers that somebody gave me was that they would trade places with someone for a certain amount of time, but then hop back in to a time machine and become themselves. So it was unexpected because based on me chatting with them offline, I had no idea that they would have picked that option. So I was like, ooh, was I wrong? But I I was up for the challenge. So I was like, you know what? Offline, I told them, I literally had to eat my words because I thought you would have said you would remain yourself based on the things that you have endured in your life. So it was kind of funny, but then it was kind of like a reality check too, because sometimes you think you know, but you really don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So thank you for asking that question. And audience, I hope you learned a little bit more about Tissa. So now we're going to dive into the main part of the conversation, which is leadership and some of the incredible things that she is doing to lead and how she became successful. Because y'all, sometimes when you see someone on a platform or a pedal stool that you may have placed them on, you don't know their start ugly moments. You don't know what it took for them to get there. So you're ooh and awing and geeking them up. But would you really want to be where they are if you had to endure the same exact struggles that they went through? Think about that because a lot of us, me included, have said, oh, I would love to do that. But that's because I saw the glamour part. I didn't see the ugly part. So I'm like, mm, if I put the ugly with the glamour, would I really be doing this? Or would I want to just, you know, take my own course? So Tissa, let's unfold this. Whenever you started on your journey, I want you to share one of your start ugly moments, but it also built character and it helped you not just survive, but thrive. I'm, I'm actually really, really glad that you asked this question and you you framed it in this way, Genesis, because I get asked a lot to mentor female founders that are starting companies and are really excited. And I always remind them that we, we really glamorize entrepreneurship in this country. And I, I don't know why it's not sexy. It's actually awful. Um, you know, there's very few Mark Zuckerbergs. There's very few big successes. And I actually spoke um, probably about a year ago to a woman who was one of the first um, black women in the country who'd raised over a million dollars and she she'd just done incredible things and she you know she said to me I, I feel like I am not successful and it's amazing what's our definitions of success our definitions of failure tend to be external right and it's it's a hard slog to start a company it's a hard slog to raise money it's a hard slog to be a leader whether that's in a startup, or in a big company. And I think, you know, you're talking about surviving versus thriving. And I talk about that a lot. And I think my sort of come to Jesus moment there was when I was running my last company and it was, it was really hard. And I realized I hadn't taken a break, a vacation, even a day off in years. And I was traveling all over the world to scale this company. And I was just exhausted. And I didn't know how tired I was until I realized I was physically leaking exhaustion in the form of tears, but I didn't even know it. So I'd be in airports or hotels or even in green rooms before I was speaking and people would say, what's wrong? And I would turn and look behind me to see what they meant, but they were pointing at me because I was crying and didn't know it. And I wasn't crying because I was sad. I was just totally, my cup was empty and you can't give to other people. You can't grow your company 
if you yourself are totally empty. And I think that was a good signal that uh, you're not thriving if you're so exhausted that you are you are empty. And I think that's when I really stopped and reevaluated it. Is, am I enjoying this anymore? Am I thriving? And that was other people pointing that out to me. So just sitting and typing at the end of the day, still working after 12 or 14 hours and just, just crying and thinking, I got to stop and refill my cup. So I think listening to your body, listening to other people and realizing the work will still be there. So sometimes just stop and take a break and take care of yourself. Yes. And I love that you said that because so many of us women out there, we're trying to, whether we're climbing these corporate ladders or we're vying for this attention and validation from other people who were never really meant to be a part of our journey. And we're just running the rat race. We're trying to get ahead and we're sacrificing ourselves. And when I say ourselves, we're self we're sacrificing us mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually to check in with something that may not be there for the long haul or the long run. And the reason why I say this audience is because I spent 15 years in corporate America. 12 of those years were in the oil and gas sector, which it is a male dominated field. A lot of times there were more people that looked like Tissa than people that looked like me. So it was like constantly just trying to do this, do that, do this, do that. But then my saving grace was actually being laid off from this Fortune 500 company one week after my father passed because it was an eye-opening. We put so much emphasis in these companies, but then in actuality, are the companies putting emphasis in us as an individual, At whether we're an IC, an individual contributor, whether we're a C-suite executive, whether we're a direct uh, report where we don't necessarily have anyone under us or whatever the case may be, and when you go home, you're incomplete and you barely have enough to give to your family, whether it's your spouse, your partner, your children, your, your dogs, your cats, or whatever that depends on you because you spent so much time pouring out into other people that you forgot the one that really matters. And that's you. Absolutely. And you know, what's really interesting, Genesis, is that I, I hear from women a lot, particularly women, but also men, if they're in a place that they don't feel takes care of them. And, or is a good culture or is, is just draining them. And they'll say, I think I can change it here. I, I, I want to take care of my team. I want to, I'm not ready to leave because I feel like I, I can make a bigger difference. And I, I like to say to people, that's good. That's a noble thought, but you, you can't turn a battleship around by yourself and you've got to put yourself first. So if we stop and think, is this a place that makes you happy? And if it's not, it's okay to leave. It's okay to look for a place where you can actually be happier, you can contribute more, you can create more value, and you can feel more fulfilled. It's not failing, it's not giving up. It's actually, I think being smarter, it's working smarter and living smarter. And there's so many times where people will say to me, oh my gosh, why didn't I do that sooner? So kind of not feeling like the whole weight of changing a company culture shouldn't be on your shoulders. And a lot of times people will leave and they'll say, people said to me, I don't know what took you so long and their teams will follow them or things like that. And I think women especially feel really obligated to their teams, but your first obligation should be you and your health. And then you can do better for your team where you are. Yes. And that sex way into the no permission needed. Do you feel as a woman, sometimes we're waiting for permission from other people versus permission from ourselves to do what it is that we were born to do that complements our ethos, that's aligned with our purpose, our mission on why we were created. Would you say that would be a driving factor for you writing no permission needed? And if not, let me know what your driving factor was. Oh, 100%. That is exactly why we called it what we did. Um, and, I, and I think it's another, another core of the book is, is also about teams and just how you lead and that you don't need permission to, um, to follow your sort of core principles and so that you know the value you bring, but also the values you lead by. And that's how you create really strong leaders, but really strong teams um, that you don't need permission to, the value you bring is a fact, but the values that you lead by are also a fact and you don't have to defend them. So when you have your operating principles, those, you don't need permission for those either. So if you, if you believe in transparency, if 
if you believe in empathy, if you believe in leading with collaboration, whatever it is, you also have to know why that is and how that creates value. But you don't need permission. And those aren't, those, those aren't going to bump up against a corporate culture or corporate values, but it's really important to know when you're going to stand up and say, this is not how I work and that's why. And it's really a lot of leaders, well over 90% of leaders that I interview or talk to, they don't, they haven't really articulated out loud. How do I lead the values that I lead by and why? So let's spend some time there dissecting that because I feel like no matter where someone's listening in from or watching it, they need to know what their core values are and what are their what's the expense of operating them? And does that look like an employee or does that look like an entrepreneur? Because let's be real, when you're an entrepreneur, you're still an employee, but you're an employee for yourself because you're working in your business until you can work on your business and you begin to work on your business whenever you're able to scale up and outsource things that are not within your quote unquote SME wheelhouse. And SME is your subject matter expertise. Yeah. So ask me the question again. So are you saying, is this equally important whether you work for a large company or for yourself? No. So I guess let me dial it back here. So my question for you is how can someone know exactly what their core values are and then partner it with their operating expenses? Meaning, is it worthwhile for me to stay as an employee or make a transition over to entrepreneurship? even though they may look similar, but they're very well different. Yeah, I, I think what's really interesting here, Genesis, is that whether you're an employee somewhere or you're an entrepreneur or a founder, it's equally important to know what your uh, what your non-negotiables are. And I'm, I'm going to give you an example because I've been both. I haven't spent a lot of time as an employee because I, I've always been very independent and wanted to sort of be a founder and be an entrepreneur. But one of my principles is respect and operating in an environment of respect. And how does that manifest? That manifests in a calm, respectful workplace for me and my teams. So if people yell, and that's this also extends into my personal life. I don't like yelling in my relationships. So, but I, I explain that to people. It's not just, I don't just stand up and say, wait, we're not yelling. That's it. I say, you get the best out of me when we're calm and respectful. And, and I think that's, you always want to contextualize why you're acting in a certain way and explaining that. So as an employee, I very first job out of college, I had a manager who loved to yell. He just loved to yell. And I know he loved to yell in his personal life too, because when his wife came in, they were always yelling. And I remember saying to him, hey, if you ever yell at me, I'm going to quit. And that was a hard thing to say because I needed that job. And I don't think he believed me. But the first time he ever yelled at me, I went straight to my desk, got my stuff and left. And he called me and said, where did you go? And I said, I gave you a warning. I told you that I'm not your wife. She might put up with it. Other people might put up with it. That is not how I work. And he said, well, can you come back? And I said, no, because I told you about that. And it was exactly the same when I started a company. And I told customers, we had customers that yelled at the people who worked for me. And I said, we're going to respectfully take, we're going to walk away from this deal investors, I would tell them, we took an acquisition off the table. And it was because this is how you got the best work out of me. And I would just very calmly say to people, when we're all ready to calm down, we can, we're just going to take a break. And so I think your operating values and principles should endure no matter what type of environment you are, whether you're an employee, a founder, a manager, um, that is should be pretty stable. Your leadership style can change, but your values are kind of like your, I don't know, I don't know why I'm making this, but it's like the, as if you're steering a ship, right? They really help steer you. They can mature a little bit as you get older, but they tend to be pretty stable, I think. And I like how you gave that example because it helped um, me visualize it. And I'm sure it's going to help the audience visualize it as well, because someone else may very well be in that same type of environment and they may not be calm and they may be, you know, more reactive versus proactive. And I love how you stuck to your guns because that shows that you are a no nonsense woman. And you said, this is what it is. And because you cross that line, you don't get me anymore. Yeah. And, and yeah. And I, here's one thing too. I think a lot of times it's easy to feel fear. And to think, wait, if I, maybe I should let this slide because otherwise it will be fatal. 
you might lose the deal. You might lose the job. You might, but nothing is fatal. It's more important that you are very consistent with your values and know your value. And because if you slip and slide on those values, it's like having, not having a life jacket in a storm, the next opportunity will be there, but you will be very unshakable. You will be much more calm and resilient. Um, there will always be another opportunity, but there won't be another opportunity to stay very, very aligned with your values. That's going to make you feel very shook up, if, if that makes sense. Yes, that absolutely makes sense. And that's a part of leadership as well, because how are you leading yourself is also going to be how you show up to lead other people. So whenever you think about leadership as a whole and you're teaching, whether your symposiums, master classes, or you know, town halls or whatever, what are some of the top leadership advices or skills that you want to evoke in a woman so she can feel confident? So she could have courage and she could be brave to say, you know what, I am a leader and I may not have a leadership title, but I can lead from where I am. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really important to know why does what you do matter so that you, you know, sometimes you may not get that job. You may not get that opportunity, but knowing, and I, I, I might overuse this phrase, but if that opportunity doesn't, doesn't happen, it's not you, you know, the shoe doesn't fit your foot's not ugly, right? So that's that's an important one. So it's not, there may not be a seat at that table, but there is a seat at the table for you. But in order to do that, I like to call it the three eyes. So identify, what, what do you do? Why does what you do matter? So what? That's really important. So you're thinking strategically, not just operationally. And then inter- the second eye is internalized. Really believe that, because if you don't believe it, no one's gonna spend time believing it for you. And then learning how to inform or communicate about it. So talk about your value. That's how you're going to really um, advocate for yourself. That's how you're going to negotiate a better title or compensation or just that seat at the table. And I think learning some of those skills about listening. Listening is really key. The loudest person in the room is not usually the most important or the influential. (laughs) Learning how to be really concise and calm. And I had a great mentor who called it, I think that's why I did this motion, this steering wheel motion, but a steady hand on the helm so that you can learn how to get your point across and then stop. So that learning how to be concise and have that executive presence. And when you really believe in yourself, other people will. And that's where you get that confidence and that presence that everybody talks about. I love that. I love the three eyes. So yeah. identify, internalize, and inform y'all. So think about yeah. that. And journal this down if you need to practice it before you show up to that next big meeting or that next big event that you have in your life. Practice those three eyes. And Tissa, another question I want to ask you before we jump into the CTA is how can women show up authentically, whether it's what they're wearing, how their tone of voice is, and et cetera, because let's be real here. Have you heard that the minute you walk into the room, they're already sizing you up before you even open your mouth? So do you agree with that? And if so, show these ladies how important is it for them to show up and then show up with confidence based on how they dress, how they talk, their nonverbal as well as their verbal cues. I I think it's really interesting what you just said. And um, there's a couple ways. So Uh, I talk about this in my book. I show up in cowboy boots to every meeting. That's just my thing. It's become kind of my brand, my signature. Um, They're really loud. It's, I'm known for that. And I also think don't sell yourself. So one of my most popular keynotes right now is called ditch the pitch. We've all been told to have this long elevator pitch about ourselves. Again, remember the person that doesn't say as much is actually more powerful. So, you know, if you can If you can just be very confident and say in two sentences, this is what I'm known for, this is why it matters, that's a lot more compelling than three minutes of trying to verbal diarrhea your way through why people should care. Um, So having that sort of quiet confidence, it's it's counterintuitive, but the less you bring to a meeting, the more powerful you are. So, you know, I used to bring everything to a meeting and now I just show up with just me. Um, Don't even bring a business card. Now I know on Zoom, but it's the same thing, right? I don't do a presentation. I just show up talk and do a lot of listening. But I think the most important, this all comes back to one thing, which is show up prepared. 
know why what you do matters, learn about people, ask questions, but that internal is, this comes back to that internalization. People can tell if you're nervous. People can tell if you don't believe in yourself. So I really think that the more that you have that confidence, and in some ways it's fake it till you make it, but if you, sh- I don't mean show up and be an asshole, but show up and look like you belong. Don't pretend that you know something you don't, but when you show up with some presence and pretty soon you'll start to take up that shadow that you're casting. Ah, uh, yes. Mic drop y'all. When you own it, you rock it. Less yeah. is more sometimes. Definitely. Yeah. So Tissa, are you ready to jump into the CTA and let's hold the audience accountable here? Absolutely. Yes. So what is your call to action for the audience? Because audience, the reason why this part is so important is what good is listening to this content if you're not going to take what you heard and apply it so you can move from surviving to thriving because you really do have something amazing to offer the world, but it's time for you to ignite it. Jump start it and get your life on track so you could be that wild card factor. Yeah, so I, I mean, I really encourage you to to think about those three eyes. You know, really, you talked about journaling. My book has it's it, just like me. I'm no, am I allowed to swear, Genesis? <laughs> I'm no bullshit. <laughs> so you know, I I've been called hyper efficient. So I, it's short, it's sweet. I want you to go and there's a workbook. I want you to literally take a pen and paper. I don't care if it's in my book or just on a piece of paper. Think about why does what you do matter? Internalize it. Talk to yourself out loud. I do a lot of that. Tell, you know, somebody said I do affirmations. I walk around and say, I'm smart. I'm great. I'm actually go ahead and be specific. Don't just say I'm smart. I'm great. Say I'm smart because I'm great because add some specificity. I always say to people, pretend you're being interviewed for a podcast. So you wouldn't just, I wouldn't just come and say, Genesis, I'm great. And stop talking. Be specific. Say it out loud. When you say it out loud, you believe it and practice it. Go to networking events, go, go to communities where you are going to have to, people are going to say, so tell me about yourself. It's the most dreaded question. Get used to answering it in a really short and compelling way. And the more you do it, the more you're going to be able to do it when it matters. Yes, I love all that. And y'all, we're going to hold you accountable because we want you to actually send us a note on how this segment has helped you because that shows that you did the work. So Tissa, tell the audience how they can connect with you via your website. And if you hang out on any social media platforms, primarily. Absolutely. Yes. So my website is my name, tissarichards.com. If you just Google my name as well, there's not another one in the world, so it's really easy to find me. Um, LinkedIn and the book, No Permission Needed. Um, like I said, there's a workbook. And if you sign up on the website, do I do a lot of webinars and courses that you can join where we literally workshop right through this. And um, I do corporate workshops so we can take a team at your company through this. And like I said, hyper pragmatic. I don't want to just talk about this. I really like you to go through this so that immediately you can start to feel what it's like to be able to walk into a room and feel like you deserve to be there. Talk about your product, your company, your team, be able to say to somebody, I lead this way. It makes a difference because, or I do this. I'm known for this. It matters because, and just there's quantitative and qualitative benefits. It makes unshakable leaders, teams, and organizations. Um, But yeah, you can reach out and find out all the places and workshops and webinars that we do. I love it, y'all. She is a rock star. And once again, that was Tissa Richards. All of her contact information will be in the show notes. Make sure you like, comment, follow, and subscribe. If this segment resonates with you, we're on 40 plus audio platforms. We're also on YouTube for those of you that like video content. And you can find us by going to Gems with Genesis Amaris Kemp. And my big ask, ASK, is for brand sponsors. It does take resources to fuel the mission and movement to bring on content that is educational, inspirational, and motivational, while also weaving in diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging Because whether you believe it or not, it takes all of us coming together to make this world a better place. So until the next guest, next segment, peace, 
love, and lots of blessings. Have yourself an amazing day. And remember, no permission is needed for you to be great. Tap into yourself and own your sh and rock it out. <laughs>